In 2018, the Oxford University Press published the most recent book of Ray Goldberg, professor at the Harvard Business School, called Food Citizenship, Food System Advocates in an Era of Distrust. His book discusses how changing societal expectations and scientific advances have challenged the main drivers of the food system. According to his book, the world citizens realize they must take much more responsibility for their food choices and are demanding for healthier and sustainable food. Because of that, Professor Ray suggests that those who are responding to these society's needs are succeeding, while those who are not are losing out. Uh, this argument raises an exciting debate for all those who are concerned with the future of the food system. And because of that, we invited Professor Ray to an interview about his new book. We are really grateful to him to find some time to talk with us. And for all those who are not engaged in agri-food studies, I have to remind that Professor Goldberg was with John Davis the creator of the concept of agribusiness. In 1955, he was also engaged in creating the agribusiness program at Harvard Business School, where he is now an emeritus professor and teaches about food policy and agribusiness. Well, unfortunately, we'll, we wouldn't be able to summarize his entire traje academic trajectory. So, Professor Ray, we want to Thank you for this opportunity to discuss with my colleague Sergio Schneider and I. And uh, to start our conversation, could you explain to us the origin and the ob objectives of your book? Uh, what are the expectations with this book and uh, what kind of audience was it written for? Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here and to be interviewed by you. I'm very grateful for that opportunity. As far as I'm concerned, uh, the book has many uh, focuses, but the principal focus is to enable the reader to understand the revolution that has occurred to the food system. We have switched from a transaction-oriented system to a system that makes people want to collaborate and make it a win-win relationship rather than I win, you lose. It's no longer uh, feasible for people to be in this system and try to take advantage by charging the most they can or trying to sell at the highest level or buy at the lowest level, they finally realize that in order to be successful in this business, you have to find a way of understanding each other's needs and relate those needs to the ultimate consumer and the society they serve. This has been a real revolution and the successful firms are leading that revolution and a good number of them are in this book. But I also wanted to make sure I had change makers from the Consumer Active Society who basically said, no matter how good you're doing, you're not doing good enough, there's more to do. So I wanted to make sure that the challenges to the food system and what's needed to still improve it was part of that book. So um, I would like to, to, to introduce or, 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 or just to mention uh, that um, in, in 2009, 2011, if I'm, if I'm not, uh, not uh, wrong, uh, in, the, in the journal Nature, there was, a, there was an article that was published uh, and use the word the nexus of agriculture, food and health and environment, or, and then several other articles since there uh, appears with the uh, with the word with the uh, with the uh, with the uh, with the concept of nexus among agriculture, uh, food and environmental, or sometimes agriculture, water and uh, and environmental. 
So I, I would like to ask you in, in what extent and, and how these debates on nexus or, or the reconnection of the food system with health issues and environmental issues is, uh, uh, in, in your opinion, is going to affect the, the unfoldings of the food system dynamics in, in, our, in our world uh, uh, at this moment and maybe in the near future? Well, I think um, the food system and the people in it recognize that they have more impact on the environment, on water, on uh, various resources, on our health, on animal health, on crop health, on soil health, and on the environment than they ever thought possible. And because they know that, they also know that the consumer who is making the ultimate decision as to what kind of food to buy is more aware of the nutritional nature of that food and is more aware of what that firm is doing to that environment and is more aware that they want their children, their grandchildren uh, to be healthier. They want uh, the environment uh, to uh, be cleaner and better. And they expect the food system to uh, respond to those needs. And most of these firms in this book and most of the people in this book look at that and recognize that if they're going to be competitive in this world, they have to satisfy all of those needs, not just the caloric needs of the farmer or the caloric needs of the consumer. So I believe they finally get it. And in this book, you will find that, and in PAPSAC, you will find every single person in that interview talking about how they are changing the system for the benefit not just for the farmer or for the worker or for the environment but for all three at the same time and to me that cooperative spirit uh, is uh, an unbelievable one uh, in a recent interview to dick virman you spoke about the origin of the concept of agribusiness. And in this new book, this concept is still there, mainly in the, in the beginning of the book, but we can easily realize you clearly prefer to use the term food system. Is this uh, because of this attempt to, to broaden the look at the food and consumption issues, the environmental issues? What's the reason for this transition of concepts? Well, the realization is that agribusiness has been redefined by many people to be a bad word. They, they think it's business taking over the food system or they're big companies. And the word business, instead of being a, a nice term, has turned out to be an evil term. So agribusiness to many people is big companies taking over the food system and making it uh, useful to them, but not necessarily to anybody else. So I felt very strongly that the reader had to realize at the beginning that ag agribusiness includes the whole food system. And if you will notice in the food system book, in, agri in the uh, food citizenship book, one of the people I interviewed was people from the Mormon church. We'd say, well, why is the Mormon church in a book like this? Well, the church has, as one of its uh, primary emphasis for their uh, parishioners, is to make sure that every people in their congregation has a adequate supply of food on hand at all times and an adequate supply of capital to replenish that food at all times. That's the only group I know that does that. And we live in a world where 
just-in-time movement of food is such that we don't have any residual supplies anymore. So I wanted to show that one group believes very strongly in making sure that people have an adequate supply of food at all times. And when we had a, uh, a terrible uh, hurricane in the South, the first person to come there with relief was the Mormon church. I'm saying that's part of agribusiness too. The church did a, another thing, not that church, but the Catholic church. Uh, one of the interviews is with a labor leader uh, who was part of uh, the migrant workers coming to our country. And uh, the uh, robinson Patman Act exempted farm labor from having a union. So what this gentleman did uh, was get the migrant workers together and come to the university. And what Harvard did, uh, one of my colleagues who helped create PAPSEC, Professor Dunlop, mm -hmm. created a resolution uh, decision-making system to be housed in Harvard Law School. That, that resolution system has created peace between the farm workers and the food manufacturers. So what I'm saying is these people are learning how to work together and these people are using uh, not just business but academic and religions to put people together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Uh, well, uh, just to, to, to make a little joke, as we talk about religion, let's uh, go back now to the word that you use, the devil <laughs> issues. Uh, I have a question about, uh, about the, the notion that uh, you, as you know, uh, Brazil is a, is, a, is, a, is a pretty important player in the international food system, especially related to food export and, 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 and soy and, and beef and, 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 other, and other products. Uh, but as you know, uh, in Brazil, uh, agribusiness has become a kind, uh, a kind of, of, let's say, uh, not fair word. And there is a lot of uh, criticism on this subject, uh, especially, especially more recently, where uh, uh, issues of environmental damages become uh, quite seriously. I, I think you, you had seen in the, in the newspaper, in the, in the, in the TVs, uh, everywhere, uh, images about the increase of the deforestation rates in Amazonia they are quite concerning the, the the people everywhere, especially related to the to the climate change. Uh, in that sense, the question that uh, I would like to hear you about is uh, if you if you think if you if you wonder that Brazil uh, uh, could change the food system, our food system as it is, in a, in a more fairly uh, way or, or 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 making the question in another way around. In what extent the food system in Brazil could become more committed with these environmental issues in order to to uh, uh, um, uh, to 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 put aside this this uh, this damaging images that uh, our our food system has gathered uh, recently. One of the people I interviewed uh, in the. Uh book was Erling Lawrenson from Norway. He created a new kind of forest in Brazil for environmental purposes. He created one of a eucalyptus trees that could be harvested and in that process of creating that forest he also put a reserve for animals and other uh, wildlife that would not take away the habitat of those people. He is now working from Brazil and 
putting forests around the world under the auspices of the World Bank. And that all came from the wonderful forest he built in Brazil. Pedro de Camargo, your uh, uh, gentleman who was in your uh, trade uh, government activities, has done something not just only for Brazil, but has created a fair trade system in the rest of the world by uh, making my country uh, that had uh, uh, a cotton program that was unfair to the producers in Brazil uh, and making it changed. He also uh, did the same thing with the sugar program uh, in Europe, uh, encouraging them to have a more fair trade system. I think you don't realize it, but Brazil has become um, one of the countries that has many leaders that are changing uh, the environmental system, hopefully more so in your country, but around the world, and are also uh, improving the free trade zone area for the benefit of everybody. So don't be too hard on your countrymen. I think that you are having people who really are making a huge difference in the World Trade Organization and in the climate area. I confess I, I'm more pessimistic about uh, the situation now, <laughs> but uh, it, one of the central uh, theme of your new book is how to create shared value. And uh, uh, our, you, as you know, our country is very dependent on uh, commodity export, uh, export uh, soybeans export. So what do you think about this dependence of Brazil on commodity export and how is it possible to create shared value with this kind of uh, uh, agribusiness focus, I would say? Well, you can create shared value in several different ways. One I just discussed briefly by having a more fair and more of a market-oriented system. But the other thing that you can do is to build um, relationships uh, in terms of um, more nutrient uh, production and more soil conservation production. You have a lot of companies in Brazil that are working with farmers to try to do that. I, I think that uh, you're pretty hard on your countrymen. <laughs> I, I don't know if it, this is because of the coronavirus, of uh, I am so pessimistic, or maybe because of this, this situation we are living in our world. But uh, your book is, is about food citizenship and about how to create shared values what demands uh, a new uh, participatory governance systems but it is this is and this is my my last question uh, uh, how can we create food citizenship in an increasingly concentrated food system which is also impacted by the increasing uh, international conflicts. I am talking about the conflict US, China, Brazil is in the middle of that. So, and how can us as researchers, universities and uh, academic centers uh, contribute to create a food citizenship? Well, I think that universities can uh, do a better job in creating food citizenship by having a multidiscipline program rather than being confined to separate departments. Uh, when I started out I, 26 years ago, I wanted to have a multidiscipline group of men and women from the private, public, and not-for-profit sectors work together for the same reason I agreed 26 years ago 
with the problems you just raised. And nobody was talking to each other. Everybody was pointing fingers at each other. So I uh, went to two of my colleagues, uh, one uh, Don Dunlop, who created labor peace around the world, and the other, my colleague from the medical school, who headed up the internal medicine units, not just in America, but around the world, and also worked very closely on all their cancer research. And the, the money that came to support this group called PAPSAP, Public and Private Scientific Consumer Agriculture Group, came from the retired secretaries of agriculture from both parties, not one, but both parties, all wanting to do what you want to do. So what I'm saying is that there is a hunger in the world. And uh, I wanted this book to be read by consumers who are so concerned, and rightfully so, that we're not doing enough to show them that the world gets it and this small group of men and women are really trying to make a difference. The other thing I think you should realize is they're not just talking about it. They want to make sure that as they improve the food system, the farmer is not taken advantage of, or the small scale producer is not taken advantage of, or the farm labor is not taking advantage of. And they have created payment systems where much of the risk that used to be on these people's shoulders uh, are now taken off. We've had a terrible time in my country recently on race relationships, and I'm sure you've seen this. And I think that it has made our country look again in the mirror and realize that we haven't done enough as far as minorities in our country and around the world. So you're right. We've got a lot of things that we have to do differently. But I wanted this book to be read not just by my academic people, but by the general population. I wanted them to realize that if the biggest industry in the world that affects the environment, that affects human and plant and planet health, health uh, and uh, really uh, the future of our planet, um, I'd like the rest of the world to know that there's plenty of hope left. And these are the kind of men and women who. Uh, are planning to do just that. They all yelled and screamed at each other at the first meeting. They each called each other liars even. But today, they don't just talk to each other in a meeting once a year. They talk to each other every day of the year. That doesn't mean they always agree on things, but they do find a way of bringing people together and these people are not just uh, the United States, they're from all over the world. So I can't help be an optimist, and I want this book to be read by the general population, not just by academics. And I don't know how to do that. So I'm grateful for this interview, and I hope this interview helps me do that. Oh, that's that's really very encouraging, uh, Mr. Uh, Ray Goldberg, uh, to hear um, uh, a very optimist, uh, uh, key message for uh, for people. Maybe maybe uh, I would I would have the chance to make you a last very last question if you if you allows me. Of course, it's uh, I am a scholar engaged with uh, family farming or small scale farmers. So uh, when people will hear this interview and they will see that I am here in, <laughs> they will for sure ask why you had not asked uh, a question about what we call here in Brazil family farming. Uh, and the point is, as you know, uh, um, um, accordingly to FAO, there are about 
for 570 million farmers units in the world and from them 500 million are considerable small scale farmers or small holders or or family farmers and uh, uh, the figures uh, about family farming indicates if we look at Brazil and also in the United States, looking at the two last census, uh, agricultural census that we have, there is a process of what is calling the disappearing of a middle. You know, uh, some mid middle family farms are, are, are disappearing. This process is a little bit uh, uh, longer, uh, already there in the United States for a couple of decades, maybe 50 or 60 years. In Brazil, it's a more recent phenomena in, in the last 20 or 30 years. I, I would like to hear your opinion on, on what could be the future of the family farms uh, around the world. Is that inevitable that the, the, the small scale farmers will, will I, I will not say disappear, but they will reduce significantly uh, along the 20th century What's your opinion in that sense? Well, my opinion is that <clears throat> it's very difficult uh, for small farmers to succeed, but there are people in that book who feel exactly as you do. One of them is Jain Irrigation in India. They decided that just as you just outlined, that these people are at risk. So what they have done is create a irrigation system with the help of the Indian government to help those small scale farmers produce a better kind of crop, a more valuable crop on their small plots. And in order to do that and not put them at risk, they automatically made sure that they had a market for those products. They automatically made sure they had a contract price for those products so that the farmer could afford to invest in all those other change-making activities. So basically, they made sure that that would happen. The labor leader in this book feels very strongly not only by small-scale farmers but it's about farm labor around the world that is being mistreated and he is working to try to make the kind of resolution institution that we have in the United States available to small farmers around the world so that small farmers and their families don't have children in the field don't and, and don't take advantage of the women in the field. And he is working with major companies to do that. And in addition to that, many of the other firms that are not in the book are also now recognizing that they have a problem with child labor. They have not just small farmers. And they don't want to put the small farmers at risk. We have a case on the Congo where the guy is trying to work not just with the president, but with the finance minister and the agriculture minister to try to get the small farmers in a country like that to work together. That doesn't mean they're all successful, but at least they're trying. And many of the young men and women that I've had the pleasure of teaching are now in responsible positions in places like the World Bank. And these men and women feel exactly as you do, that these young farmers and small-scale farmers uh, have long been mistreated and not given the opportunities that they should have. In addition to that, they also feel that women in agriculture have not been treated fairly as well. So when, when you listen to their voices, uh, if you take that icon in the back and put it on your computer and see the passion of these men and women, they are working exactly on the problem that you're talking about. These people are with the World Bank, they're with other institutions uh, that are trying to make the small scale farmers succeed.
And uh, it's an absolute necessity, and you're absolutely right. It's long overdue. Uh, there's no question there's going to be more consolidation in our industry. There will be more people that are, are large. But at the same time, there are going to be more successful, more small-scale farmers as these people develop rules and regulations that are, make them treated fairly and make men and women equal partners in the food system. So I am optimistic. And if you read all of these examples, but more important, listen to the passion of these men and women, you'll realize that they feel just as strongly as you do about that. All the poverty in the world is in the small scale farmer. All of the uh, health problems are with the small scale farmer. And all the starvation problems are with the small scale farmer. So they, they know where, what needs to be changed. And fortunately, these people are doing that. And in addition to that, they're responding to Mary and Nestle. They're, you know, people uh, like the Mars uh, candy. They are actually putting notices on their candy to be eaten very small amounts and only once a week. I mean, how many people tell you only to eat your item only once a week? So I, I think that people realize they have much more responsibility than ever before to make this planet a healthy one, to make our population a healthy one. But most important, they're finding ways of all working together. And I feel very strongly in our very divided world. You have problems with your government. We certainly have problems with my government. But the people themselves know that they have to solve the problem because they no longer can rely on some of what's happening in our world today. Uh, I, I can't tell you how grateful I am that I lived long enough uh, to see the food system do what it's doing. I grew up in North Dakota and uh, I saw the poverty that was there. I saw the small farmers losing their farms. And uh, I never wanted to see that happen again in my country. And I certainly don't want it to happen in the world. So I think you'd be very proud to see the Brazilian students that we have that come from your country who feel just as strongly as you do and are going to do something about it. So thank you for the opportunity. My thank pleasure. you so much. Thank you, Professor. You're welcome. You're thank welcome. You.